love for Jesus who died and is gone. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, thank the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thank the glory. Revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for thy spirit of life, who has shown us our Savior and gathered our night. Hallelujah, thank the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thank the glory. Revive us again. To the Lamb that was slain, who had borne all our sins and has sent Hallelujah, thank the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thank the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Fill his heart with thy love. May his soul be rekindled with one from above. Hallelujah, thank the glory. Hallelujah.
Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. We thank you for this beautiful day and for all the mercies you have shown us. We are grateful that as we come to the close of the month of February, we are in the last week and we are trusting you to guide us through this week as well so that when we enter the month of March, we will have an even more greater thrust into the plan and purpose you have had for us for this year 2024, Lord. We pray that every day we will be so full of the things you have been teaching us from the word of God, the vastness of the God whom we serve, whose thoughts towards us are precious and weighty. And we pray in the mighty name of Jesus that every single thing that we will learn even today will be a blessing to each one of us. Let there be an opening up of our understanding. May there be a change that happens in our minds. May the past be totally done away with, O oh Father, for your glory. Especially the one that has to do with things that bring bitter thoughts and bad memories into our mind. We thank you and we worship you. Great is thy faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and Amen. Last week when we were closing, I shared with you from Isaiah chapter 43, verses 18 and 19, God's instructions to us as believers. We are not to have in our memory any thought that robs us of confidence in God. Remember, thoughts are not always bad. There are good thoughts you can think of. Remember when David came and stood before Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 17. And let me read to you that portion of scripture from 1 Samuel chapter 17. 
the bible says even before david went to meet goliath standing before king saul david recounted certain things that came from his memory and i want to read to you from first samuel first samuel chapter 17 and verse 33 onwards to verse 37 and saul said to david thou art not able to go against this philistine to fight with him for thou art but a youth and he a man of war from his youth now these are the words of saul you must understand that saul was actually very concerned even though he was full of demonic spirits by this time still he was very concerned about david because he was looking at a very young boy a ruddy person as described for us in this particular portion of scripture and you know all these things were playing in Saul's mind why should i send a young boy to his death because that man goliath is a man of war from his youth he is a fighting man he knows all the nuances of warfare he knows how to use spear he knows how to use the sword and david said unto saul thy servant kept his father's sheep and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock now this is memory words from the memory coming out and i want you to pay attention to this because these are not words that will weaken david's faith in god or david's confidence these were thoughts that were proper he was recounting them to saul he said a lion and a bear both came after a lamb that was there in my flock and i went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth and when he arose against me i caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him thy servant slew both the lion and the bear this uncircumcised philistine shall be as one of them seeing he had defied the armies of the living god verse 37 david said moreover the lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear who delivered me the lord those are the memories that you need to have not the memory of failure not the memory of pain not the memory of hurts not the memory of disappointments not the memory of some failure that you encountered when you try to do something in your own might he said the lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear he will deliver me out of the hand of this philistine and saul said unto david go and the lord be with you amen today i want to share with you about how this god who has promised to make rivers to flow in the desert and who said i will make a way for you in the wilderness still wants you to understand that all this is made possible because of his intervention in your life deliverance comes from god blessing comes from god 
In fact, it is the greatness of God that brings blessings, not your personal greatness. And that's why it's important for you to understand Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 3 about the will of God concerning his children. The will of God is I will pour water upon him who is thirsty. Are you thirsty? God says he will pour water upon you and floods upon the dry ground. Remember the dry ground is willing to receive water. God says I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your seed and my blessing upon thine offspring. God's righteousness, God's greatness must be what floods and fills our mind every day. Every day just like when we get up in the morning and we say God's given me one more day. God's given me one more opportunity to live. You need to also believe that God's given you one more day to meditate on his bigness. To meditate on his greatness and vastness. And you don't sit and make God look like some petty street end God. He is not a petty street end God. He is the God who is the creator of everything. Elohim. Creator God. And he wants you to understand that every time you focus on yourself, you stop a lot of blessings from manifesting in your life including the blessing of financial harvest and increase. Because what comes into play is your unworthiness and, in your, and your inabilities. Unworthiness is a dangerous, dangerous thought. Why? Because righteousness makes you worthy. When you play with unworthiness, you are actually playing with what is called unrighteousness. Most people don't think of it in that context. They think that it's humility. No. Worthiness is strongly linked to righteousness. So when God imputes righteousness to a man or credits righteousness into a man, What comes with righteousness is worthiness. God now looks at you and says, you're worthy because I have adopted you into my family. You're now a family member. You're not a stranger. You're not a Gentile. You're not a heathen pagan man or a woman any longer. You're a child of God. Adopted into the family of God with the same rights and privileges which are given to my son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the word made flesh. And when you begin to understand and let that sink in, which sometimes it takes a certain amount of time for it to really sink into a person's system, because we are so much used to living in sin, so much used to listening to words of unworthiness. Nearly every day somebody addresses us as sinners. Sometimes it's in English, sometimes it's in the local vernacular. People use those words so easily. And they call us sinners. And we often 
instead of asserting that we are a child of God and no longer a sinner because of the blood of Jesus, end up letting those words enter into our psyche and we begin to slowly believe those words. Therefore, God wants you to, today, change your focus. Start focusing on things that matter, not things that don't matter. Two weeks ago, I shared with you about why you need to keep your eyes fixed on the grapes of Eshkol. Today, I want you to understand your focus must be on the righteousness that comes from God himself. Remember, he alone is worthy of your total focus. He is the source of everything. He is worthy of your attention. And that again is one reason why in 2 Corinthians, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 5. The Bible reads like this, not that we are fit, qualified and sufficient in ability of ourselves to form personal judgments or to claim or count anything as coming from us, but our power and ability and sufficiency are from God. I want you to write down those three things as it is found in the Amplified Bible. Power, ability, and finally, sufficiency. Very important words. Power, ability, and sufficiency. They are from God. Now, the word tells us in verse 6, it is he who has qualified us, making us to be fit and worthy and sufficient as ministers and dispensers of a new covenant of salvation through Christ not ministers of the letter of legally written code but of the spirit for the code of the law kills but the Holy Spirit makes alive amazing verse he is the one who's made us fit worthy and sufficient you need to highlight these scriptures and remind yourself my worthiness is based on the God who has called me righteous. Because of his righteousness, he has made me fit, worthy and sufficient. Hallelujah. Now when you believe that, your faith is so activated and it thrusts you into the very presence of God so that you can receive a miracle harvest that you deserve. Remember, self-sufficiency is a deadly trap. There are many who have got into that trap and have never been able to get loose of it. In fact, millions, they don't pursue God or the principles of God or invest any time to be with Him in the secret place. When you read Psalm 91, Psalm 91 talks about the secret place of the Most High God. I want you to remember that everything highlighted in Psalm 91 is highlighting the blessing that comes from being in the secret place where you find your dwelling. That means you are living in the secret place. Very, very important. 
So what happens is when Christians are confident in their own ability and in their own might, suddenly they find that they lack the confidence. And they find that they are awfully short of the requirement needed to do something. And then they oscillate between weakness and then arrogance. But you must understand that when somebody says he needs nobody, they are making a big mistake. Especially when people make this uh, statement, if something has to be done, it's up to me. Remember, that kind of philosophy appears very nice and wonderful. It looks like the person is bold, he's able to take a very strong step in the right direction, he's very self-confident. But remember, God rewards humility. That's a very, very, very important requisite in the life of the believer. And I've already told you what humility is. Humility is accepting God's word and giving it first place regardless of how we feel. I may not feel good. I may not feel up to it. But if it is something that I read in the scriptures which tells me this and this and this is what God is desiring of me, then humility is me casting aside my feeling Casting up aside everything that is standing in the way and saying, God, I submit to your word. I will accept your word as true, as faithful and as the only source from which true life flows. Remember, in God's system, you will fail without a total dependency on him. You have to depend on him totally. God will not let you succeed alone. It's not possible. When you read 1 Samuel chapter 15, come with me to 1 Samuel chapter 15. We need to read some of these verses and then we are going to close in prayer. 1 Samuel chapter 15. Look at the words of Samuel that he spoke to Saul in verse 17. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. God always rewards humility. The Saul who was selected to be the first king of Israel was a man who was full of self-doubt, unworthiness and who never considered himself to be a worthy leader. Still, when he went seeking after Samuel, in response to his servant who said, let's go and meet the prophet. Maybe we'll get to know where these lost donkeys have gone. You must understand, God reached out and selected that man to be the king over Israel. But by the time 1 Samuel 15, 17 was being verbally spoken to King Saul, Samuel had used these words to show how much Saul had deteriorated to the place where the word of God didn't mean anything to him. In fact, that entire chapter is hinging on a king who refused to listen to an instruction from God, who put God's word as second place, 
who put all the rest of the material things he was getting in first place and then coolly put the blame for his actions on what the people demanded from him. Remember the old Adamic nature lies dormant in every person. It is a nature that longs to be independent of God. It longs to be a God in its own right. It's an Adamic nature that does not pursue God. And that is the reason why in the Christian believer's life, the Adamic nature, the old nature, the natural man, if you want to live your life in the best of what God has ordained for you, that old nature must remain dead in your life. Remember, not to pursue God for a financial harvest is to live and operate like a fool in this world. It will take more than hard work for an uncommon harvest to come to you. It will require more than just working overtime in your job for financial blessing to reach you. It will require more than just attending seminars on financial prosperity and reading books on financial prosperity for financial prosperity to break loose in your life. Remember, an uncommon harvest requires an uncommon provider. And God knows this. That's why his name is Yahweh Ire. And I want you to write that down. We have a word in English that we say is Jehovah Jireh. But his name is Yahweh Ire. Literally, meaning the God who makes provision even before the need arises. He is an uncommon provider. And that's the reason why an uncommon harvest it's not common, it's uncommon. That uncommon harvest can only come from an uncommon provider. Till you understand this, believe me, you will have one crisis upon another crisis upon another crisis happen in your life. You have to learn to acknowledge God as your provider. Let me read to you from Psalm 119 and verse 71. Psalm 119. Psalm 119 and verse 71. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. Remember, your hard work and efforts are wonderful seeds. They're not bad seeds, they're good seeds. Your willingness to sit and to learn from others who are maintaining you are again good seeds. Remember, they will always be recognized and rewarded. But never be so foolish as to pursue a harvest that doesn't require the supernatural intervention of an uncommon provider who is your Jehovah Jireh or your Yahweh Ire. Nothing you could ever produce for yourself will satisfy that eternity part of you. There's an eternal part of you. And the only person who can touch that part and satisfy you is a God who has the grace to extend to a person eternal life. Let me read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verses 6 and 7. Now this is Paul writing. I planted, Apollos watered, 
but God all the while was making it grow and he gave the increase who makes the seed grow thank god for the one who planted thank god for the one who watered but all the while i want you to mark that down because sometimes in some versions of the bible you may not find that all the while while you were thinking it is you or someone else it was god who was making it grow and he gave the increase so neither he who plants is anything nor he who waters but only god who makes it grow and becomes greater hallelujah it is only god who makes it grow and become greater hallelujah the invisible you requires an invisible god the impure part of you requires a pure god the untaught part of you requires a mentor and a teacher the blessed holy spirit most people miss a financial harvest because they see themselves as their only source of every blessing they don't see god at all they think it's me it's my work it's my business it's only through this that god can bless you don't know that one person who thought like that a man of incredible strive an incredible vision so much so that he was the first world ruler nebuchadnezzar nearly got destroyed because of that kind of a thought pattern that dominated his life come with me please to daniel chapter 4 daniel chapter 4 and we are going to read verse 30 daniel chapter 4 and verse 30 why self reliance is so dangerous that it can kill you the king said now this is the king talking to himself is not this the great babylon that i have built as the royal residence and seat of government by the might of my power and for the honor and glory of my majesty megalomaniacs often end up with this kind of a mindset they believe it is them it is them it is them it is them they even identify themselves as being self made they don't understand that that kind of mentality can ruin them and can take them down a deep and destructive road where there can be no return remember it's tragic when you become your own god because when you read daniel you will find that nebuchadnezzar wanted people to worship him as god remember you are not alone when you plant a seed but god is a important integral part of the that miraculous cycle of a financial harvest and he is your true source but self sufficiency angers god whether it's in the old testament or in the new testament he will ne- never let you forget it verse 31 while the words were still 
in the king's mouth. Daniel chapter 4. Verse 31, while the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling will be with the living creatures of the field. You will be made to eat grass like the oxen, and seven times a year shall pass over you until you have learned and know that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he will. That very hour, the thing was in process of being fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men and did eat grass like oxen as Daniel had said he would. And his body was wet with the dew of the heavens until his hair grew like eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird's claws. When you read Daniel chapter 4 verse 34. At the end of the day, seven years, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes to heaven and my understanding and the right use of my mind returned to me. And I blessed the Most High God and I praised and honored and glorified Him who lives forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion. And his kingdom endures from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, What are you doing? Can you imagine... A megalomaniac who had declared himself as God was taught that there is one greater than him. And he acknowledged it openly. And he acknowledged that no earthly ruler can override God. And in his declaration he says in verse 35, And God does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what are you doing? You may not like to accept the words of a common man, but you will definitely have to accept at some time or other that the words that were spoken by the first world ruler, Nebuchadnezzar, was not just an individual king of an individual place. He was considered the first world ruler, such a man made this statement and it can be a word that is on record today, to date, that this is the God that we serve. He is a God in heaven above who rules on earth beneath. And that's why I told you whether it's in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, God is angry with anyone who behaves in a dangerous way and proclaims himself to be a God in his own right. We'll read one more scripture and we're going to close. Acts, Acts chapter 12. And we're going to read verses 21 to 24. Acts chapter 12 and verses 21 to 24. To 24. On an appointed day, Herod arrayed himself in his royal robes, took his seat upon his throne, and addressed an oration to them. And the assembled people shouted 
It is the voice of a God and not of a man. Remember, the adulation of people can come. But it is up to you whether you will accept it or you will ascribe glory and honor to God and refuse the adulation of men. Please listen very, very carefully. And at once, an angel of the Lord smote him and cut him down. Because he did not give God the glory, the preeminence and kingly majesty that belonged to him as the supreme ruler. He should have told, no, I am not God. There is one who is ruling in heaven above. Remember, in no way did Herod ever match the excellency or the splendor of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. But still you find here is a man who is longing to be in the position of a god. And he was eaten by worms and died. Look at verse 24. But the word of the Lord. Here was a man who gave a wonderful oration. But the words of a man and the oration he gave, nobody even remembers it today. All that they remember is he died of worms. Worms ate his body. Look at the next verse. The word of the king of kings. The word of the lord of lords. The word of the entire God of the entire universe. But the word of the Lord. Concerning the attainment through Christ of salvation. In the kingdom of God. Continued to grow and spread. I want you to know. That God's word cannot be contained. It will always grow and spread. Many people have come. They have tried their uttermost to contain the word of God. They have failed. And it's not because I have said they have failed. History itself tells us that everyone who has tried to contain the word of God has failed. Because God's word has the capacity to continue to grow and spread. Hallelujah. We're going to pray and close. But don't come to that place where you're looking at your own ability, your own self-sufficiency. You'll miss the blessing of many, many financial harvests that God wants you to have. Your sufficiency should be in Him. Your declaration of your sufficiency must be in the one who blesses the seed and even before you know it or even think about it or you're even conscious of what is happening, it is he who is causing that seed to grow and to increase. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' mighty name, we give you thanks and praise. For this high privilege you have called, given us to call you Abba Father. We are grateful that you are Jehovah, Jireh, Yahweh, Ire. The Lord God who makes provision even before the need arises. We are grateful for Abraham who called upon your name when he saw the miraculous provision of a lamb for the sacrifice that you had provided, O Father. O mighty Father, we are grateful that that man of faith was able to see your provision and to understand that it was a pre-ordered provision so that he could receive Isaac back to him as one who had been slain and risen from the dead, O Father. Mighty Father, we give you thanks and praise that today we stand in awe of your bigness, your greatness, your majesty, your might, your power, your dominion and your ability to rule over the affairs of men. No one can look at you and say, why have you done this? Oh, mighty Father, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders. We pray that there will be wonderful acts of miraculous supply that will come into your children's lives. May many who are in debt get out of debt. May they see divine provision come into their hands so they can repay their debts, oh God. Things that have been mortgaged and 
placed as mortgage be redeemed in the name of Jesus through the power of the blood of Jesus that makes all provision available to your children in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus healings and Lord divine energy flow into the bodies that require healing this day Lord we thank and we worship you great is thy faithfulness blessed be your name in Jesus' precious name we pray and everybody said Amen and Amen and may the blessing of God the Father the blessing of God the Son and the blessing of God the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of us both now and until Jesus comes again and the under our Jesus Christ in Kirubayum Pidavagi Devan and Anbum to your Parishutta Aviyanadi Aikimum the Mood Kude Indrum Yendrum Irpadage Amen and Amen Hallelujah Hallelujah Thank God for His Word His Word is a blessing to us every time we open it and let the Holy Spirit open the eyes of our understanding to see what pleases God and what infuriates God. God is angry with sin. He is angry with the proud as well. But he loves those who love him. And he loves those who choose to walk humbly before him. The book of Proverbs tells us before honor is humility. Thank God for his word. And thank God for this opportunity he has given us. Not only to receive his word. But to share his word also with others. Please. Reach out to somebody with the word. That you have heard today. Share this teaching link with them. And see how God blesses their life as well. God bless you. And have a wonderful week. And remember. God is totally good. And he is the one who is the never ending never failing source of your total supply god bless you unakedi ragave aayudam vaikade unakedi ragave ஆயுதம் வாய்க்காதே உன்னை அழைத்தவர் உண்மை தேவன் அவதாசற்கு நீதியவர் உன்னை அழைத்தவர் உண்மை தேவன் அவதாசற்கு நீதியவர் என்னி என்னி துதி செய்வா என்னடங்காத கிருபைகளுக்கா என்றும் தாங்கும் தம் புயவே இன்ப இயேசுவின் நாமமே என்னி என்னி துதி செய்வா Make sure you don't miss receiving our free monthly newsletter The Pulpit which contains a four part teaching series on various bible topics that will help you live in victory you can read it online by going to christchapel.in and click on ebook library where you will find all our newsletters available to receive a physical copy of pulpit you can go to christchapel.in and click on join now and fill in your complete postal mailing address along with your contact mobile number and we will be happy to send it to you free and postpaid should you want to receive the newsletter via email do include your request along with your current email id thank you and god bless